So welcome everyone to tonight's program, Landscaping with Native Plants. Um, glad you could make it tonight. It was, um, it's, we're gonna have uh, more to talk about now because we have rain, it'll help feed our yeah. plants. Sky Carol Jowdy, aka Sky, is a landscape painter on faculty in the art department at Plymouth State University. She's been there since 1994. And her love of nature and her desire to make a difference in the plant on in the planet drove her to study environmental design at the Landscape Institute in at Harvard, where she earned a graduate degree. And she's been designing and installing landscapes in the Lakes region and central New Hampshire since 2004. Lots of other things she can tell you about herself, but welcome tonight to Landscaping with Native Plants. And if you're not on mute, that's a good thing to do. I think, Gina, I'm gonna pop you on mute. There you go. Um, so welcome everybody. Go ahead, Sky. All right, thanks for coming everyone. And um, I just wanted to start by saying that um, this is, uh, by no means a comprehensive survey of native plants. It's more like some that I've found to be really um, dependable and uh, user-friendly, available and affordable and, and really um, able to create some really nice combinations um, with these plants, species. So let me just share my screen and see if we can, we can start working here. Everybody seeing that okay? Yeah, it looks great, go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, landscaping with native plants and it's about, we're gonna work with uh, native trees, shrubs and perennials for intentional design, which I consider uh, what a garden is. And I'm actually gonna start with a little prayer. Um, a Native American prayer about the earth because I, I have to say that this program um, definitely has an uh, ecological theme or threads running through it because um, the planet needs our help. And this is a really great way to help the planet by working with native plants and just kind of feeling indigenous like a plant, like a native plant and, and uh, working together with nature rather than against it. Um, so, I'm gonna let Amy admit somebody because it just took away some of my prayer. There you go. Okay. We give away our thanks to the earth, which gives us our home. We give away our thanks to the rivers and lakes and oceans, which give away their water. We give away our thanks to the trees, which give away fruit and nuts. We give away our thanks to the wind, which brings rain to water the plants. We give away our thanks to the sun, which gives away warmth and light. All beings on earth, the trees, the animals, the wind and the rivers, give away to one another, so all is in balance. We give away our promise to begin to learn how to stay in balance well, with all the earth. And that comes from a, a little book called Tending the Earth, Mending the Spirit, The Healing Gifts of Gardening. And I like to start with the earth and um, this beautiful quote by Wes Jackson. Nature's geometry is an important organizing principle of ecological design. It determines the context of design, the intentional shaping of materials, whether at the scale of a root system or an entire watershed. And so I love to do this thing where I, we can zoom in from the highest point in New Hampshire, which is Mount Washington. And um, zooming into my, my little piece of the earth, and this is pre-garden uh, down here before I had any gardens uh, at my house. And uh, it's quite different today. And some of the pictures you'll see will be parts of my garden. So let's start with a few definitions um, of what a garden is. And these are my definitions, the intentional shaping of materials within a de de defined space and time for aesthetic enjoyment, food production, 
or outside rooms. And let's look at what a landscape design might be, is a man-made space that punctuated or punctuates and may interrupt natural communities for cultivation to shape and change or manipulate the land. And native species, uh, this is a kind of a funny word because some books uh, look at it in different ways and some resources, but um, using a book called Native Plants of the Northeast by Donald Leopold, and his definition is a species naturally occurring in an area, state, province, or region prior to European settlement. And um, just like to say something about natural communities, because some natural communities rival composition, structure, and aesthetic of any garden. In highly dynamic space, species grow, flower, produce seed, go dormant, and mature over time. Some die, leaving space for colonizing, colonization of new species. So just what happens in the natural world is um, kind of rivaling what we do in our gardens. And I'm gonna start right in with some trees um, that are some of my favorites. And um, this is something that just stopped blooming, Amelanchier. And showing it in its natural community on the side of uh, Welsh and Dickey um, with hemlocks and spruce and, and uh, in, in its natural community. And then we can look at that same Emelanchier, which is Shadbush. Um, it's got many names. Um, and there it is cultivated in a landscape. So you can see how early this um, blooms. It blooms in April. And it's always so welcoming to have something blooming in April. I think it's just one of my favorite things, one of my favorite plants. Um, you can see that just by what, el what el else is around it, which is nothing is happening yet. And there's azaleas there and ferns and goat's beard and blueberries and all kinds of things going on there. So there it is in its, uh, in its cultivated form. And there it is in my yard, which it's just like a dream. When the weather was really cool, this uh, spring that a lot of our blooms just held on for a long, long time. So it was, you know, a week or 10 days or more that I got this gorgeous uh, display. And also the Emelanchia, it starts out, it's one of the first things to leaf out with a very beautiful bronze colored leaf. Um, which is unique to everything else in the forest. And again, you can see that nothing else is even leafed out at all. Um, so this is a very, very lovely, welcoming tree. And um, so when we mimic, mimic natural ecosystems, like what we've been looking at, in stru structure and function, process patterns and rhythms, and we can build these really nice relationships, um, like something we see in, in nature. And this is a little Rodera on the edges of Squam Lake, um, also blooming very, very early in, um, in April, April, May. So just to give you a sense of what this Amelanchia is capable of, and I think about plants, looking at plants that have lots of really nice attributes about them, not just like one wonderful thing. Um, so this is what it looks like in the spring. Again, it's in a cultivated area. And this is what those flowers turn into is a berry that the wildlife love this, birds, squirrels. And then another beautiful attribute, it has this gorgeous fall color. And if there's any berries left, this is very late in the fall. I, I thought I remembered this happening in the winter, but I don't know what those cedar wax wings would have been doing here in, in um, January, but it, maybe it was more like November because uh, the Emelanchia really gets picked over. Um, it's just loved by birds. So another lovely um, specimen native plant is a pagoda dogwood, a cornus altinifolia, and that um, both of those names are really interesting because the altinifolia means that the leaves are alternate on the branch, and the pagoda part is this beautiful structure 
in this um, tree. And then that's the flower, which is actually just about flowering right now. They're just beginning to go from this yellowish to this cluster, not unlike uh, some of our other dogwoods. Um, but you can see that the leaf is very similar to other dogwoods, kusas, et cetera. And that's the berry, which is also loved by uh, wildlife and birds. Uh, you barely ever see them, they're gone. And it's got this other really beautiful attribute, these, um, this red stem is really quite distinctive. And then that's the uh, fall color of a pagoda dogwood. So lots of, lots of uh, things from early spring into the late fall to uh, make this a favorite tree. So this is another wonderful species. Um, the witch hazel, Hemimelis virginiana. Um, and there it is as of literally yesterday in the green. Um, young tree, beautiful structure. And, um, and this, the Hemimelis virginiana blooms, this native blooms in November. So the top right is actually looking out my window, my second story window at, at PSU. And that's what I see in November. <laughs> and so you can see this tree will grow to uh, 25 feet high or so. Um, but they're, they're a slow grower. And um, they literally bloom with this funny little star-shaped flower at the same time that the leaves are turning yellow in the fall. And the lower picture is um, one in the wild. Uh, that, uh, yeah, the one across from my office is, is definitely cultivated there. Um, so here's another kind of forgotten tree, uh, larch or larix, laricina. Um, so this is a conifer. I think it's our only conifer that um, actually loses its leaves. So it, it, it loses its needles, excuse me. <laughs> um, so it turns this lovely yellow in the fall, probably the last thing that you'll see, the last little bit of color. And, um, and then it loses its needles and starts all over again, which is very, very unusual, but kind of an underused plant. And often in a wetland area is where you'll see it. Um, on the left, that was kind of a swampy area that I took that picture. And um, here's a really lovely tree, uh, Cornus moss, another underused species, small. So here's a like a kind of a list of those attributes that I've talked about. So this is a small tree, April bloom, very, very welcome to see this first blooming thing in the spring, along with the, I think it's even before the amelanc year. It's got a nice compact structure, an interesting bark, uh, wildlife berry, and scarlet fall color. And this is a full sun tree that loves full sun and um, zone four. So it's a really hardy thing here, really underused. And this is kind of a new tree to this, um, to this space. So I just wanna say that I think that the blooms are looking a little kind of clustered. It survived the most amazing drought last winter. It went in in, in July and um, it made it. <laughs> so that's all I could say is I usually the flowers would be much more um, prolific across the whole plant, but I think it's uh, it's just came out and said I'm alive, I made it, and uh, it's happy, happy where it is in its new home. It did come from a nursery, so um, so it's uh, first year on that site. So one of the things about ecological design and landscaping is putting the right plant in the right place, uh, which is really, really important in terms of light, moisture, um, just the needs of the plant, soil conditions, etc. And this is a fantastic plant, Ilex verticillata. Um, and you see these just, you know, punctuating and dappling the landscape in the fall um, with those beautiful berries. And that is also, um, Ilex is also a wetland plant. 
So it's uh, happiest in with its feet wet in a kind of a wet or swampy lowland area. So some of my favorites, um, and this is the hobblebush, which has just finished its amazing bloom. Um, not, a, not a plant that you can easily transplant and rarely seen in a nursery, but there are similar viburnums that you can, you can get in nurseries. Anyway, viburnum alnifolium. And um, so here it is in bloom. And if you walk a lot of the river trails around up Shikoro or Brook Trail, um, Bennett Street Trail, you'll see these are along the river. And there's the a picture in the fall where it's just starting to turn. It turns so many different colors from deep burgundy to yellow, orange, red. It's just a stunning, stunning specimen to just kind of, I think, enjoy in the woods. And they, when, if you try to move them, they take a long time to adapt. They, they really want to be where they are in the woods. And um, now this is a this is a plant that that I love, and this is in my yard. And uh, it's just the bees absolutely consume this. They just completely cover this plant right now in the now. This is what it looks like right now. Um, Aronia and black choke cherry, and it's not a it's not a bush that the birds really love. It's it's not super sweet. So those berries will stay on all winter. And if they're really, really hungry, they'll go for this. But there are other attributes about this black choke berry because my neighbor actually makes wine, the hill people, and they make a Arunia, Arunia wine. So um, it works for wine, not so much for the birds, but they will, they will come around in the, in the winter if they're really hungry <laughs> and they'll go for the Arunia. Anyway, it's a really nice size, 10 to 12 feet mo at the most. Um, just got a nice little structure and, uh, and, a, and a sweet smell. Not an over, you know, overwhelming smell, but a very light, subtle, sweet smell. Um, Mountain Laurel, which most of us know about. This is actually the pictures are taken up at uh, Tin Mountain where there's just an incredible woods area of uh, mountain laurel that I, I must say it must have been planted at some point. Um, this is not something you'd see here in our woods. Um, a little further south, yes, um, but fantastic um, native plant and it's been hybridized and there's lots of cultivars of this. I, I stay away from them because they never grow as well as the native um, and some wild edibles, uh, mostly for birds. This is a, a, a cornice on the left, a red, red twig dogwood. And you can see that little white berry, very popular with birds. And a viburnum on the right, also very, um, birds love this plant. So, um, and then wild edibles, some more wild edibles. Sambucus canadensis, black elderberry, which I am growing. And this is a great plant because the, um, the flower can be used um, uh, and uh, cooked or sauteed or um, not really sure how else other people use them. Um, and then, of course, the berry is good for um, resp respiratory. I make a tonic with them. And this is the thing that the birds love. If you see them looking like that, this is where they go to red first and then to this black. Um, within a couple of hours, a bird, a flock of birds can clean that right out. So you got to keep your eye on those if you want those berries. And they're easy, easy to freeze if you can't, don't have the time right then to uh, work with them because it's, it's a spring plant. It's an early summer and, you know, we're so busy doing everything else in the summer. Um, I tend to freeze those berries and make elderberry tonic in the fall or winter. So another wild edible, dandelions. It's amazing how much uh, energy and money people put into eradicating dandelions. And there's absolutely no part of a dandelion that's not useful. The leaves are great. Um, liver cleanser. Uh, yeah, it's like a detox. D dandelion is a detox. And um, the flowers and buds can be sauteed and my neighbors, the hill people, also make dandelion wine. So it's a very, very valuable plant. And uh, 
not to eradicate it <laughs> and think of it as a weed, which some people do. Um, wild cranberries, we've got lots of wild cranberries around in our bogs, which is fantastic, which are lovely to freeze as well. They'll, yeah, great thing to put up and uh, keep. And also we've got just wild edibles. Our mushrooms are fantastic. And hopefully this rain will bring some out for us. And cultivated uh, edibles. I didn't go into this too much, but there is, as you know, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries. Uh, I've got, um, I can't wait. Um, not the choke cherry. It'll come to me in a second, what I'm thinking about. Oh, um, yes, I've got elderberries as well. Um, so when we mimic, mimic natural ecosystems and structure and function, landscape design becomes ecological design. Um, and what we see there is diversity of species, patterns of organization, interactive communities, self-regulating ecologies, new self-renewing forms of fertility, integrative systems, and no waste, because waste, all waste is someone else's food. And uh, what we're looking at is a self-sustaining landscape in the end. So here's a few things that, that nature does when we leave things alone. If we just leave a stump like that, things just want to grow in it. On the bottom left, we've got Galtheria growing there. And I think it's an aster on the top there and a little hemlock. So some of my philosophy about landscaping is to leave things alone sometimes and really study what's around the landscape to see what wants to be there. And oh, the thing I was trying to think about is black currants, which I'm growing and uh, which are also great for wine and um, jam and coming in very, very prolific. So. So I'm kind of moving from trees to shrubs and a little bit of ground cover here, but one of my favorite shrubs is uh, Viburnum acerifolium. It's a maple leaf Viburnum. It's just um, got so many redeeming qualities. It's just this beautiful maple leaf. Um, and it's also a cluster of flowers, white flowers coming in the next few weeks. And it's a colonizer. It's colonizing with roots underground uh, like rhizomes and can just fill a space. And, um, and then of course it has a, a, a berry, a blue, dark blue berry, almost black that the birds love, squirrels love it, chipmunks. And the fall color, I need to get a picture. The fall color is almost an indescribable sort of bronze, light burgundy that is just uh, really remarkable. Um, and I wanted to just say this is a false, um, Oh gosh, the name is not going to come. It'll come in a second. <laughs> Solomon Seal. Thank you. <laughs> Paul Solomon Seal. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> um, Tiarella cordifolia, fantastic little plant. Uh, loves shade. Uh, don't put it in the sun. It'll just melt away. And um, yeah, great little ground cover. Uh, but yeah, that's why right plant, right place is important. And as you can see beside that is a little Christmas fern. Um, so yeah, that plant will just melt from the sun. Oh, another one of my favorites, uh, goat's beard. Um, now this is also called uh, false astilbe. This plant can get up to about five feet high and Aruncus dioicus. Um, and it, it is a self seeder. So if you don't take those seeds away, you'll find little plants here and there. Um, take these seed pods off, um, and yeah, it can. It, it, but it, but it's it's not it's not super aggressive. It's it's a really nice plant, um, and it's it'll be blooming. You know, sort of June, long long bloom time, and bigger than any astilbe you've seen. But it it is it looks like an astilbe. Um, and Aquilegia canadensis, wild columbine, can't get enough of this plant. Great, great ground cover. Um, there I am kind of in a sea of it. And, um, and here it is with some um, ostrich ferns. So that gives you a sense of the timing. So those little um, wild columbines are up right about now. Um, and just as that, that ostrich fern, ostrich fern is the, um, 
help me out again, Amy. Um, <laughs> fiddleheads. The fiddleheads. <laughs> yay. yay, Amy, the fiddlehead. <laughs> or my brain is not here to, today exactly. So anyway, yes, um, that is the, the actual um, fern that the edible fiddlehead. And I, I wanna just say something about that is it, it doesn't hurt the plant at all. It actually helps because this is a very vigorous um, colonizer, the, the fiddlehead fern, uh, ostrich fern. But if you take the fiddlehead and eat them, it, the fern has to recover. Uh, and so it's less likely to be moving around your yard uh, if it has to recover. Uh, so, oh, another really welcome spring plant, Iberus uh, sempervirin, candy tuff. And um, the top picture is uh, in a garden where it's got, um, oh boy, my brain is really going out, a uh, heuchera around it. And um, also super welcome early plant. Um, and I was just kind of showing how it likes to live. It can live in, in among these rocks and be very happy. It's just so welcome to see flowers coming when nothing else is happening. <laughs> and um, this is a tough plant to photograph, the geranium maculatum, um, but it is so beautiful in its, in its own right. It, and if it, it is a, it's a pretty vigorous uh, self-seeder. If you've got a nice edge or natural area, it kind of likes part sun, part shade. And, um, yeah, it's blooming right now, and it's just a really satisfying plant. It also, uh, the leaves turn gorgeous red in the fall, so it's got some nice qualities that take you through the season. And if you don't, you know, these, these self-seeding, um, well, which a lot of our natives are, if you don't want them to self-seed, just, just remove the seed. It's not that big of a deal if you care about it. Um, take a bucket and just cut those seed pods off, and if you want them to go everywhere, that's great. Um, yeah. So another really, really welcome plant, and I think it's a very much underused, sort of an old fashioned plant, Euphorbia. Um, as you can see by everything else, there's nothing else going on in this garden. It's very early April with that um, Iberus. So just can't get enough of a plant that wants to be in my garden in April. And that's, uh, they're actually not really flowers. They're actually, they're actually sepals. So they're actually like, more like petals and they bloom, oh my gosh, they bloom for weeks and weeks and weeks. And this will also um, turn red in the fall. So let's just look at some other ground covers in native plant communities. Um, hay scented fern on the left. And this is a bunchberry another type of cornice. It's actually uh, qualifies as a shrub. It's the shortest shrub in the cornice family. Um, it's about four inches tall and the bunch berry, as you know, the little red berry later in the fall. Um, and that's a real alpine plant. If you try to put that in your garden, that's by the side of the road, literally, with some lobish blueberries here. Um, <clears throat> you try to put it in your garden, it might well not want to be there. We think about zones, it's probably a zone three. And you can see that up on the trails, you know, on in the White Mountains. Is that's where it wants to grow. It doesn't really want to grow in zone four or five. Um, that's where it's happiest. And a few things, um, fringe polygala, just a few things we see in our landscape in this lovely little oxalis. Um, lady slippers that are happening right now as we speak, just as beautiful as can be. They'll really love this rain. And this little Canada, Canada lily as well. So yeah, I just saw lady slippers the other day and it's amazing how things survive with no water in the woods. Almost no water at all. <clears throat> so this is also uh, on the side of Welsh and Dickey. This is what blueberries do in the fall. Um, turn the screaming red and it, this is just a, such an amazing, uh, picture with, with this blueberry all amongst the, the lichen and the mosses and um, just a quite an amazing fall sight. So, so we're getting into the um, some ground covers, which are lovely. Um, and there's that Aquilegia again, and we have Myositis here. This is a forget-me-not. Uh, 
Myositis sylvatica. I don't seem to forget the scientific names. Um, and this is sweet woodruff, Gallium odoratum, which is a wonderful ground cover that's in bloom right now. All three of these things are in bloom. Um, this is a great picture. This is a hobble bush that was transplanted into this garden, not by me. And it literally took about eight years to bloom. Um, and got a rhododendron maxima back here. And this is actually a calmia, I believe, uh, one of the hybrids. Um, and um, yeah, not sure what that fern is there. But here it is again um, with that, uh, there's that, another false Solomon seal. So this picture was taken a little bit later. And that's how amazing that um, Gallium odoricum, odoricum can take over um, an area as a, it, just a beautiful ground cover, definitely a shade, shady application uh, or part shade for sure. And one of my all-time favorite plants is Anemone canadensis, which is, blooms at probably about June. Um, it's an early native anemone, there's lots of anemones. And again, kind of a, a low light shady area, likes to be wet um, if it can. <laughs> it was a great rain that we all prayed for. Um, and yarrow, Achillea. That just landed in my yard. It's it's everywhere, and um, I don't mind it being everywhere. It's a wonderful plant. Um, yeah, it's just let it go wherever it wants to go. And um, so hosta, which is not really a native, but I love that this little geranium has grown into it. Another another example of kind of my philosophy of leaving things alone. Um, I just don't think I could have made that happen if I wanted to, <laughs> um, but I, ju I just love that growing right up through the hosta. And this is a this is a lovely little native spot here. This is a these are maiden's hair ferns, um, <clears throat> Christmas fern, and Veronicastrum virginicum, which is a lovely uh, perennial. And I'm trying to see what was back there. Uh, not sure I can say. I think I've got another picture. Maybe I can see it better. Um, this is kind of a progression of um, some plants. Uh, this is a cat mint back here, Nepeta. Um, Digitalis grandiflora, the only true um, perennial, the yellow variety. Um, the others move around. They're biennials. You have a plant one year and that's not there the next year. It's somewhere else. And this is also a very vigorous cell seeder, this um, Digitalis grandiflora. You have got to cut those seeds if you don't want it in, in your entire garden. I rarely will uh, put that in someone's garden for that reason. Actually never put it in someone's garden. <laughs> you want it on your wood's edge or in the, yeah, somewhere where you can just let it go. Um, and this is a Joe Pye weed coming up. Uh, actually, there is a Calmia in here as well, but this is Joe Pye weed coming up, uh, which of course will end up being about six feet high in the end. And nice little uh, salvia here. Um, so it's good to see that little progression happening there. Um, and just designing with some, uh, you know, with some natives. And so echinacea, which is really a kind of a meadow plant, we've seen it in everyone's garden. It's being hybridized and everywhere with so many different hybrids and um, varieties. Um, and here we have uh, a little blue flag iris, which, and this is uh, Rubachia in the foreground. And this is all among these um, sensitive ferns, which is one of my favorites, just kind of growing in amongst all of that, which is just, just lovely. So here's another picture of that area um, with the um, maiden's hair ferns. And this is actually, this is a carex, uh, a type of grass. Pennsylvania sedge. And this is a, a interesting plant that's hard to find. Um, citronella, it's wild citronella. And I think it came from the New England Wildflower Society in Birmingham, Mass, which now has a totally different name, but um, great plant. Uh, it, this, it sends up a tiny little unnotable flower that if you rub your hand on it, it's very strong scent of citronella. 
Um, and there's that Veronicastrum again, beautiful uh, shade to sun plant. Yeah, here's a, here's a great uh, picture of that um, mains here fern and that little carex in its in its heyday. It's again sort of a shady area that it would like. And just some more design with um, this is a bee, bee bombs with the echinacea. I tend to like to design things with close colors and different structure and different um, textures. So and the hemocallus, the lily, which is nothing native about it, <laughs> um, but there's another um, Monarda. Did them on that beautiful red bee bomb. And there's a picture that just doesn't want to come out of this PowerPoint, I, so I left it in. Um, it's a sensitive fern again, it's just a little path on Yarmouth Island in Maine, and it's just uh, completely covered with ferns except for the path, just what nature does for us. Um, I just want to look at a few things uh, in colors here. We've got our um, Asclepius tuberosa. Um, and caltha, um, marsh marigold, caltha palestra, and that's that digitalis that I just spoke about, digitalis grandiflora, and that is a ma musk mallow, and a little uh, rosa rugosa, and a helianthus, uh, uh, woodland sunflower. And a few um, pulmonaria. These are very, very early plants, just lovely early species. Uh, Polymonia, Jacob's Ladder, um, and um, I think this is hyssop, and this one's up for grabs. I, I think it's Nepeta up close, a, a variety of um, catmint, actually. And some really late, late species, which is um, this is an anemone, anemone uh, tomentosa robotissima, fantastic plant, beautiful leaf structure that you watch all season long. And these flowers come slowly, very, very slowly, and then they in these huge stalks and, um, and last a very long time. Beautiful kind of a antique rose color. And this is an Actaea simisifuga, black cohosh, many names uh, blooming into October. Way, this is the last thing that the bees all over it. It's a fantastic plant. Every yard should have one. And it's also, uh, these are both kind of part shade plants. Um, and just a few more, uh, just there's that Iberus again coming in um, and just some kind of combinations of species. And Joe Pieweed, we really want that Joe Pieweed for those monarchs. And um, great to have a little water in your garden for birds and a uh, little water feature here as well. And just, yeah, just going through some other varieties of, there's that Veronicastrum again, kind of in its full, full bloom. And we've got some hosta here. Some little non-natives have snuck in here. This is a Japanese fern and We'll let that happen. Some beautiful moss there. There's another, um, here's a beautiful, um, this is Rosa Rugosa, end of the season with its rose hips and a little um, crab apple there, malice. And there's that hobble bush again on the left and that bunch of berries. And here's an interesting plant underused as well. Um, Solidago, this is goldenrod. I definitely spec this into landscapes. Um, but again, it it's, can be, become vigorous. You want to have it on some edges or places that you're willing to let it just keep coming. And there's that caltha palestra again, that uh, wetland plant. Um, yeah, and so I'm doing more and more uh, with no lawn, designing without lawn. And this is a, a property in um, Conway. And also this is a very low mow lawn which I'm exploring more and more. Uh, you can either not mow it at all and it might get to be four or six inches and flop over, or you can mow it every three or four weeks, but um, great little um, combination of fescues. And these, these species were um, purchased from a, a website called American Meadows, which I can't say enough about. 
um, just a great website with instructions and lots of information. Um, so more about no lawns. This is lots of um, Heather and Juniper horizontalis, spectacular way to handle an entry of your house. And this is of the lakefront down here to the right. So these folks wanted to not have a lawn. And so we just had lots of ferns and the still be happening there. Very conscious of the lake. And uh, um, just a few more. This is actually a, a, another wildflower field. And this is what can happen to them if you're not careful. Um, the lupin and certain things like rutabecchia want to take over. And there's a simple solution is just cut down those seed pods. And if you don't want that to happen. Um, and this is that solidago in a landscape, that goldenrod with some yellow lilies and, and um, yarrow. Um, and that's another progression of that same wildflower field, um, probably a year earlier with lots of um, sweet william and more species. And those uh, uh, lupin can get very aggressive. Yeah, and there's some lovely joe pie weed there. Oh, and I. I don't want to miss that. That's that's a tupelo, that that red tree, a spectacular uh, uh, shoreline tree. And just ways to simplify a landscape, ferns. This is a snowdrop here. Doesn't hurt those ferns, not a problem. And this is just hay-scented fern. Um, very uh, economical way to landscape. <laughs> so our goal is to generate resilient self-maintaining ecosystems that are uh, self-fertilizing, renewing and self-regulating, that produce clean water, preserve, produce clean air, preserve clean water, protect and recharge our groundwater, build soil nutrients, support biodiversity, and do not depend on fossil fuel. What a great idea. So ecosystems to social systems is this idea that interactive native communities help sustain life for all species and have the power to connect people with the land, which is really important. And we saw that happening last year when people couldn't go shopping and couldn't do a lot of things they like to do. Um, and this is just a lovely garden in my neighborhood. People just living off the land completely. And I just love this picture because connecting children to stories greater than themselves. Now these, this, this little guy is probably almost well, I don't know, in his teens at least. Um, but I did this, uh, worked with Moultonboro Elementary School to plant an orchard. And those children are, they're dancing around their trees and um, they shape our future. So connecting children to the land, I think is a really important thing. And um, just wanna end with a quote, a couple quotes actually. Um, and this is Albert Einstein. We live in an optical delusion of separation, and that delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting our affections to just a few persons nearest us. Our paths must be free, must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. And there we can stop and hopefully we have, uh, we can answer some questions if you have them. And um, yeah, and I'll leave a couple minutes to just end with a couple of beautiful quotes by the Dalai Lama about saving our planet. I have questions. Okay. So is hobble bush the same as basswood? No. American basswood is um, trying to think of the species name. Uh, it'll come to me. <laughs> or maybe Amy's Googling in the other room. <laughs> um, I don't know that one. <laughs> American basswood is, um, I can't think of it. No, they are not the same thing. The, vi the cobble bush is a viburnum. Yeah, American basswood. It'll come to me, I think. Or I can look it up in my book right here. Hey, you know, it's interesting that you say that because the leaf is very similar. It's a, it's a heart-shaped leaf, but the American basswood is a full-blown tree and the hobble bush is not. Hobble bush will get to maybe 
six six feet high, maybe maybe eight. And and will a hobble will a basswood have flowers? Yes, it does. At the same fact, time of year? Just about the same time of year. Actually, there's a phenomenal basswood. I'm just trying to somebody, maybe I'll get somebody to Google that. There's an American, there's an amazing American basswood in Ferncroft at the White Ferncroft home out when you're coming out the um, Dicey Mill Trail. Yep. And it will be covered with bees when it's in bloom in probably huh. just a few weeks. It's a monster tree, huge. Thank you. The um, scientific name is not coming. It'll come maybe. <laughs> like the eight ball, it surfaces slowly. Could you um, repeat the names of those two October blooming plants? I didn't catch them. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, one is anemone, anemone tomentosa robatissima. It's very robust. Um, and it's not quite October, it'll go into September for sure, but it's the, um, the Semisifuga, Actea, um, black cohosh, of which there are quite a few, a few varieties. Um, I think the one that I like is called Brunette. So it's a little bit of a dark leaf, kind of a purpley leaf. But yeah, it is the last thing in my yard, in my gardens that will be covered with bees in, late October, depending on the season. Now it can go into November. Wow, thank you. Makes the bees happy. <laughs> and will it live in Massachusetts as well as New Hampshire? I, I think it would, sure. Yeah, yep. thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty versatile plant. And there are some varieties, um, like I said, I find that one to be, the most dependable and also that um, anemone that there's lots of uh, late blooming or mid-season anemones that just don't uh, stay as robust as that tomentosa. Um, there's one that's uh, yeah got the award of the year a few years ago, um, Honor Jobert. I've never been able to keep that plant alive for some reason. It's a, And it's a white anemone, smaller. Um, yeah, that's that one, the to tomatosa is a very vigorous plant. And a nice, it spreads by rhizomes as well. And I had someone on a garden tour once that said, you know, oh, I, I had that plant and I had to get rid of it. And I just said, well, you put it in the wrong place. <laughs> right plant, right place. You, you, it's a tough plant to put in your garden because it will kind of dominate, it can dominate. Or separate it and give it to your friends. Other questions? Digitalis. So mm -hmm. I originally had yellow mm -hmm. digitalis. Spreads, spreads quite well. But without planting anything else, I now have digitalis that is white and purple. And so what's going on there? Um, is it a garden you inherited? Yes. Ah. <laughs> um, yeah, the Digitalis grandiflora, the yellow, is the only true perennial, meaning if you put a plant here, that plant will be there next year and the year after and the year after. Okay. And it will also, like I said, vigorously self-seed if you don't take the seeds off it, seed pods. The, um, the other foxgloves, the yellow, I mean, the um, purples and the pinks and the whites are a biennial plant. So that original plant that you had in your garden, I never expect them into a garden because they will never be in the same place, but they will seed to somewhere else in your garden. Um, so they're not dependable that way. They want to be at a wood's edge where you can just let them do that. Um, so there must have been one in your garden that you inherited. And um, yeah, it's not like that, that Digitalis grandiflora morphed or something or hybridized. Uh, I don't think that's what happened. I think you probably had, especially if you're seeing a purple. And it could have come in 
from someone else's garden too. That that happens as well. How close is your garden to someone else's garden? <laughs> yeah, not uh, not too close. Yeah, I mean, some things get moved by birds, but yeah, um, I suppose that could because those digitalis grandiflora seeds are tiny. They're like specks, like. Yeah, they're tiny, tiny seeds. So they can be moving, they can fall off on an animal and then the animal walks through your garden. Lots of ways that seeds move around. Um, but yeah, not dependable as a plant that's gonna stay in one place. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have burning garden questions about natives? I think we can say thank you, Carol. Thank you so much for this program tonight. And um, there will be a recording of it if anyone's interested in sharing it with their friends. Thank you so much. Any Anyone has any last quick things? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to share something um, <clears throat> uh, from the Dalai Lama about our climate. Uh, he says that we need a revolution of compassion, but a couple, just a couple little quick quotes. Um, this beautiful blue planet is our only home. It provides a habitat for unique and diverse communities. Taking care of our planet is to look after our own home. And then he says, environmental education about the consequences of the destruction of our ecosystems and the dramatic decrease in biodiversity must be given top priority. Uh, but creating awareness is not sufficient. We must find ways to bring about change in the ways we live. It, it is common sense that we cannot survive if we keep working against nature. We must learn to live in harmony with nature. And that's what I'd like to close with. Um, yeah, it's a really good idea to work with native plants and work with na nature in general and um, not be in competition with it. And uh, Make it happen in your garden. Thank you. You're here. Thank Thanks you very much. Coming. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>